Welcome to Direct, Meditating on the Way, particularly the way it is found in the Psalms. And my name is John Mark Hicks. And my name is Bobby Valentine. I do want to welcome you to the way as we think about the Psalms together. And this particular episode, we want to focus on Psalm 19. And Psalm 19 is, is a powerful message. It is a, a very popular psalm in some ways. Uh, it certainly reflects a theology of creation to some degree and a theology of the Torah and our response to that. But as we begin, and before we read the psalm, Bobby, um, what is, you know, what's the genre here? What, what is this psalm doing? How does it function in the Psalter? That's a good question, John Mark. Psalm 19 is oftentimes called a wisdom um, psalm or a Torah psalm. You will recall that the book of Psalms itself is divided into five books, and they are introduced by Psalm 1, which we've already covered. It tells us, like our title for our podcast, Direct, that we want to follow the way of God. We want to meditate on that way. And Psalm 1 and 19 and 119, along with some others, Psalm 33 and, and a few others, that kind of invite us into a particular way of thinking about our relationship or God's people's relationship to creation and living under that creation in the way of God, which is the Torah itself. And so we see that even in this particular psalm, how... Uh, a priest or maybe a prophet would stand in the temple of the pilgrims and, and instruct them as they gathered together to listen to the wisdom that would be imparted. It teaches a proper response to uh, the glories of the universe that is around us and how to interpret that, as well as to open our ears and open our eyes to the instruction of God, not only through creation, but through the story as we're going to find out the Torah of God. So it's a wonderful way of uh, this genre of instructing God's people, growing and meditating, becoming wise, as Paul will say, in the ways mm. of salvation. So yeah, I it think reminds that, us that we're, we're listening to two voices here, we're the voice we of are, creation, the voice of the heavens and, and the skies. And we're also listening to the Torah, the, the narrative, right. the instruction <clears throat> of, of God's own story with Israel in particular. So, right. you know, we get the word Yahweh in, you know, in verse seven, when we start talking right. about the law, whereas yeah. before we're talking about <clears throat> El or Elohim, El. the yeah. God, kind yeah. of God of creation. But then there's the God of the people, God right. of Israel, uh, in, that is given the Torah. And the final section, when, and we think about three sections here, and as we read it, pay attention to the three sections, one through six about creation, seven through 12, is it, Bobby, the, the, about uh, the Torah, and then 13, no, it's 12, 13, 14 is the last section yeah. where okay. we're responding oh, yes. or, the, or the prophet or the priest or the worshiper, whoever yeah. it is that uh, is leading this meditation uh, in the congregation, because as we see in the very inscription, this is for the director of music. So the, uh, it's from David or belonging to David or part of the da Davidic Psalter, uh, is part of the Davidic collection, probably is what that might mean. But it it is directed toward the choir master, you might say, or the band leader or the, the one who's going to put it to music. And the one who's going to uh, orchestrate, you might say, the uh, wor the the use of the psalm in worship at the temple. So exactly. we always have to keep a kind of a temple mindset when we read the psalms, and right. that it's a communal event. Not uh, these psalms may begin; some of them may begin in an individual experience, but they ultimately, as part of the psalter, become part of the communal experience of, right. of Israel. <laughs> So when the worship leader leads God's people in this, one of the things that we've already mentioned is that he is responding or reminding the people that God is always speaking. And this psalm helps us to learn to discern that particular speech 
that is mm-hmm. coming from God as a group of people. And we do it in the community together and listen and follow uh, on the way. So it's a very powerful song. Yeah. Well, let's let's read it. And Bobby, we'll let you take the lead there in reading okay. Psalm 19. Psalm 19. Uh, to, uh, for the director of music, a Psalm of David. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. They have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from them. Yet their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. In the heavens, God has pitched a tent for the sun. It is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, like a champion running um, to run his course. It rises at one end of the heavens and makes its circuit to the other. Nothing is deprived of its warmth. The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The decrees of the Lord are firm, and all of them are righteous. They are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the honeycomb. By them your servant is warmed, and keeping them there is great reward. But who? Can discern their errors. Forgive my hidden faults. Keep your servant also from willful sins. May they not rule over me. Then I will be blameless, innocent of great transgression. The word, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, Lord, my rock and my Redeemer, the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I notice when you're reading that, Bobby, sometimes you know the psalm so well from other translations that you kind (laughs) of expecting to see that word or or, or that phrase, and you kind of bring together a couple of translations while you're reading it. I did. That was, uh, you know, that was the NIV. And there are some differences when you look at uh, compare the translations, and we'll talk about one of those in particular here in this first section uh, about whether it's line or voice. But let's begin with verses one to six and and think about the creation message here. What is the psalmist saying about creation? What is the psalmist wanting us to hear and take into our hearts from those opening lines? Well, I see this as, again, part of the wisdom tradition. And the wisdom, the sages, they were in awe of God's creation. You look up, and again, this isn't a time before there's light pollution and streetlights and, and all that kind of jazz. And so on any given night, you got the Milky Way and thousands of stars sparkling in the sky. And it's clear. And, oh, what an awe-inspiring sight it is. And you see the flowers, even Jesus brings attention to that in his Sermon on the Mount. And so these these sages are in awe of this, but not only them, the world around them, they were so in awe that sometimes they worshiped the moon and the stars and even the sun itself. And so what the psalmist does here brings us back and say, yes, this is glorious. It's glorious because there is a creator God and he has made this stuff kind of like in Proverbs 8. This is his handiwork they are not deity they are the created and as his servant even the son itself you know god the creator god is he's going to be identified as yahweh in a couple of verses he provides a tent 
for the sun, whereas other cultures may be worshiping him. He's glorious, but he's actually a servant of God. And as they're pouring forth this speech from the heavens as a message being brought down to earth, not only to earth, but all the earth, it is a proclamation that God's God's Hesed fills all creation, like in Psalm 136, where it opens up in the first nine verses, where the Israel and the same temple would be singing about this glorious stuff. And after each refrain, the steadfast love of the Lord endures forever. Or right. Psalm 33, that the world is filled with God's justice and his Hesed. Or Psalm 104, that the world proclaims so. When we has come together as God's people, we do not worship this like maybe the Egyptians or the Babylonians. We recognize it as the handiwork of God that's proclaiming his glory, but also his hesed, also his justice. Right. And, and we have talked about this uh, because those lights in the sky, the planets and the moon in particular, that in the Jewish calendar the israelite calendar that those things are placed up there in order to call israel to worship and so the psalm leader the worship leader says look up and you can see and you know when it's time to come use accommodatively here when to come to church you got the new moon it's time to come and worship you got the the seasons and all of a sudden it's time for passover so you have the proclamation of God's hesed in creation, but also God's glory and his hesed is being proclaimed across the whole world in terms of his story of redemption. And I think this comes yeah. out later on in this particular yeah. psalm in the second half. That's what yeah. the Torah does. That is, that's, that's, we've received it and now we're meditating on it. We're marinating on it, kind of like Psalm 1 has called us to. But that's what I see yeah. going on here day by day and night by night, that those messages are just filling well, let's, the world. Let's pick up on a couple of things there. You, uh, you've uh, introduced us to a lot of different ideas there. I, I think you're right. There's, I don't think it's an overt polemic, but I think it's a subtle polemic. It's very subtle. That, yeah. that God is in charge of the sun. You know, God, God, God is, is the one who right. shelters the sun and then right. gives the sun it's uh, entrance into the world every morning. So God is kind of managing the creation, the creator right. and provider and manager. And so that there is that subtle polemic against idol worship or turning mm -hmm. the sun into an idol or to another God. <clears throat> There's one God and this God uh, is the God of creation. And when the heavens and the skies speak of this God, um, it's not, of the sun that they speak it's the right. sun who speaks right, right. The, the, the heavens the... and the sun speak about the glory of this god because this god is the creator and the one who manages the world and, exactly and then you know you're thinking about the voice it's a voice without a voice that's a voice without kind of the voice. way it's kind of the way the niv translates it um that there are that there are no words but yet we hear words exactly we, there are no words but we get the message Right, uh, and that in verse four is where you, you know, we have a difference in translation. There, some yeah. translations go with the Hebrew text, which says a line. God is stretching a line, a line. across. Mm -hmm. Whereas uh, other translations, like the New uh, New International Version, goes with voice, which is based upon the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible, the Septuagint. And Syriac and some early patristic, like Jerome, I think, is one of those. Uh, so there's a difference in, okay, which one makes the most sense and which one is the best translation for Psalm 19? And, you know, I, I, I have a tendency to go with voice, but you have a tendency to go with line. Tell us about that. Why would you think line is a better way to go here? Well, I'm... I actually don't think they're either or. I think the line is an unspoken word. It's it's a uh, like a stop sign. Okay. That's, again, I go back it's a signal to uh, kind of thing. it's a signal. Okay. So you have uh, in Genesis 1, 14 and 15 where the the text there says that the stars and the moon, it doesn't call it the moon, the greater light and lesser light are placed there as signs for the season. And these wisdom traditions, that's what they look at. They explicitly identify that 
in another uh, apocryphal book, the book of Sirach, chapter 24, where it just says the moon is given as a sign for the festivals. So here you have this line that's in the sky that God has stretched across the sky that when we look up, we not only had some vague notion of God's hesed and his justice because the sun is great and the moon is beautiful. We actually have concrete reminders in the sky of the story of God because the moon has been placed there as a sign to call us to when it's time to celebrate the Passover or the Shavuot or um, even tabernacles. So that is what I would see. It is a signpost that is placed out there. But I don't see these as either or. Uh, I think in terms of dynamic equivalence, you know, as the NIV wants to be, that the word voice, but it's not voice that is uh, like you and I are doing right now. It is just something that's calling attention to itself and pointing to something else. Does that make sense? Yeah, that does make sense. And I don't think we have to make a choice. Although when you're translating, yeah. you got to choose a word here. Right? Well, you do, you do. <laughs> and that's why you have footnotes that say, oh, OK, here's an alternative exactly. way exactly. based on manuscripts or, or whatever. But the point is still the same, ultimately, yeah. uh, that that the creation is there testifying to the creator and the glory of the creator. Yeah. So, yeah. I, and I really like the, the imagery of the sun that when God lets the sun out of the tent, as it were, that, yeah. that the way that we experience that, the way we experience the morning dawn is like a bridegroom coming out of the bridal chamber, you know, after that first exactly. night together, or like the champion racing, uh, and, it's rejoicing. It's this kind of it celebration of life that that it when is. we wake up in the morning, we see the sun rise. God is faithful in creation and the sun continues to rise every morning. And we rejoice in that morning. We but, rejoice and it's oh, beautiful. Ahead. I said yeah. we rejoice and it's beautiful. And it's so beautiful. There's, yeah, there's something a, there that's just like, mm, wow, man. Uh, there's there's a beauty to it. And and yeah. there's a, a warmth to it, right? It, it ends the coolness Absolutely. of the night, and it brings warmth. Nobody can hide from that warmth. You know, no. As we, we know in these high temperatures in the south at the moment, nobody's hiding from the warmth. <laughs> and, you know, uh, it's warm out there. If you go outside, you're warm. And they uh, had no AC in the ancient world. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> you know, uh, they had to find caves maybe where they could get a little yeah. coolness maybe or just dip into the Mediterranean. Exactly. But, yeah, so... That last in verse six, you know, it rises from one end to, of the heavens to the other and it makes its circuit. Uh, there's a regularity to creation, which makes science possible, right? And Absolutely. Because Absolutely. there's a regularity, we can have kind of a scientific knowledge and we have predictability and we can mm -hmm. see, watch these things work and have a kind of a security about the, the rising mm -hmm. of the sun. And we can rejoice in that and be happy in that. Now, there's another wisdom book, though, that takes the sun in a different way, and that's Ecclesiastes 1. Remember the sun? Oh, the sun is just kind of boring. It just keeps going around and around and around, and just the same stuff happens over and over and over again. And and this is just like we're chasing the wind. and it's chasing the wind. So, mm -hmm. so what makes the difference between those two perspectives, I didn't ask you this before, so I'm dropping this on you <laughs> out of nowhere. Uh, well, that's, a, I think, a good question. I think here in this particular case, not wanting to deny anything from Ecclesiastes on its own. Exactly. I think these two texts come from similar backgrounds. This is a wisdom text. You know, the fear of the Lord is, you know, that, mm -hmm. that comes from wisdom stuff. You get so that Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes uh, certainly... I think has gotten to the point where he is failing to see in his particular life, the joy of that particular moment. Yeah. And this, when the people come together in the temple on this one, the psalmist is bringing them to a specific point, which is going to be the story of God. The right. story of God is proclaimed again through those signposts in heaven and his justice and his mercy and all that. But it's going to bring them to the 
the story, which is the second half is the Torah and mm-hmm. understanding what that is, which is something that tells us that even in Ecclesiastes, you know, that I'm going to have to finally, when the chips are down, you know, there is some joy in the world. There's, yeah. You know, there's there's exactly. good things. But it, sometimes it seems like um, life goes on uh, after the joy of living is gone, as uh, John Cougar Mellencamp saying. And um, I think perhaps Ecclesiastes, he's had a bad day. Well, Which I we think all you know, they're just you frustrating know. things in life, right? I mean, there are, uh, and I don't and think this text denies that at all. No, Psalm nineteen doesn't do that. No, That's I think the Psalter itself it comes right after Psalm eighteen, after all. Right. Like exactly. So I and, think um, I think you're making a good context is is everything, right? It's, absolutely. That's that's the main rule: context, context, context. And context and context. I've heard you preach that before, so I, I, I know that. <laughs> all right, I learned that. Uh, so Psalm 19 has a particular context. It's the it celebration of God's life with Israel, right? And so they're remembering the line in the sky. They're remembering the signals that are in, in the heavens uh, about God's glory. Whereas Ecclesiastes is dealing with the frustrations of life and the mundaneness of life and the routine of life and the death that is at the end of life. Absolutely. And still, the, the writer of Ecclesiastes, as you pointed out, still calls us to joy. He says there's Absolutely. nothing better to do than to enjoy your wife. Go go get Absolutely. dressed up. Go drink your wine. Enjoy your, your spouse yeah. and do the work that you have in Ecclesiastes yeah. 9. And yeah. all of that in the context of God as creator. I mean, right. The son has this routine, but that's that is that routine is the uh the result of the creative work of god so even it's, if he comes down to the kind of the conclusion remember the creator in the days of your youth right absolutely. chapter 12 verse 1 or in right. ecclesiastes 3 so well, the son is obeying living in the same story yeah exactly psalm 19 and ecclesiastes are living in the same story but different circumstances call out different dimensions of the story they do they do yeah, yeah. So let's let's talk about the story then. I mean, that's what we come to in verse seven when we right. are introduced to the Torah, or the law, or the right. instruction. Um, you can even call it story because the Torah is is primarily narrative uh, in itself, and so we're we're identifying. Okay, here's the Torah of Yahweh. Right. So I I do think there's kind of a move there. From the creator God to the, the, the God who is the covenant God, the God who enters into covenant with Israel and whose name is <laughs> Yahweh. And then we get a description of the Torah. Right. How would you characterize this general description of the Torah? What, right. what, what do you want to say about that? Well, I would say verse 7 <laughs> explicitly identifies the creator God as the God of Israel. Right. That's where I would begin. But in verses 7, 8, 9, what is that, down to 10, you have a statement, poetically, of course, of what the Torah is, and then you have a statement of what the Torah does, what it is, and what it does. So mm. it is perfect. It is blameless. It is um, something that revives or refreshes uh, the human life. That's what it does. Uh, it The decrees of God are true, they're sure. And what do they do? They make wise the simple people. You know, they make wise those who are open to instruction to a better life. That echoes clearly Psalm 1 and even some stuff in Ecclesiastes. Uh, the whole book of um, Proverbs. Yeah. That's right, the hope of the Proverbs. Uh, the precepts of of the Lord are right, and they rejoice the heart. The commandments of the Lord are clear. They're, they bring enlightenment to the eyes, which I think ties back into the glory of the sun. The sun illuminates everything, and God's Torah does the same thing in, in our life as individuals. Yeah. And, as, and, and you can't as, hide from that either, right? And I mean, you can't hide from that. Well, that's nothing right. is it's, hidden it, from the eyes of the Torah, it, right? It, it illuminates. And when it describes these things as sweeter than honey— we have to remember that this is part of a, again, especially if those 
signposts in the sky are pointing to the the Sabbath and the Passover and Pentecost and Tabernacles. That's the story, okay? That this is embedded within the actual narrative, the story of God, that all of these, sometimes we want to take them out and make them into like individualized things, but they're not. Those things that we have, decrees, statutes, all that, are embedded within the narrative of God redeeming Israel and making them his own. And it's that story that gives meaning to all of the precepts, all the commands, all the things. Those are the things that refresh us and bring life because the God who is filling the world with creation and hesed and justice, he's doing the same thing to the individual Israelites who are receiving that life-giving uh, hesed that's creating them and making them a nation and saving them from themselves and delivering them even when they are wayward and God still dwells with them and he gives them the the bread of angels and uh, all that this is this this is the thing that's greater than myself mm. that's what this story is this is what the torah is the torah is this thing that uh points to life points to the author of life points to the um well the the narrative of life Right. And, and provides I, provides guidance for human flourishing. Right. I mean, that's kind exactly. of what we're saying. We, and, we we learn who we are right. in that story and how so, we're supposed yeah, to from live. creation and Genesis exactly. uh, through the covenant with Israel. We 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 come to understand human identity and Israel understands its own identity as uh, the people of God. Exactly. So I, I really like uh, one of my favorite phrases here is making wise the simple. I am. Uh, and we can under, misunderstand that word simple because some people think of that, oh, those must be the stupid people or something like yeah. that. But that's not the point here. The the simple yeah. are the maybe naive, but more <clears throat> more properly, I think they are just the innocent. They don't they don't have a wisdom to make a choice. Yeah. It's like uh, we don't want to put the nuclear button in the hands or nuclear trigger in the hands of a five-year-old right i mean that's not <clears throat> right there's a wisdom that comes from living and there's a wisdom that comes from living under the torah and abiding by the torah and listening to the instruction of the torah and it makes the innocent wise so this it, it's, it's exactly what paul said about the whole old testament right the whole Absolutely. bible Absolutely. making wise this is able to make you wise under salvation in Second Timothy chapter three, verses exactly. you know, fifteen, sixteen. So this, and that's that's part of what it is to say that what God wants to do with us is not burden us, but to form us and to form us into wise people who have light in our eyes and who have integrity in our souls and joy in our hearts. And that's what the Torah was intended to do. Exactly. And I think it's important. I just want to throw this in here because people come to this and they read the word law, especially in our restoration tradition and Protestant tradition. And they, again, they filter Paul in here through a certain perspective and law is bad. And law is legalism. Law is whatever. But uh, the word law is really an unfortunate translation, at least I believe that it is, and quite a few scholars will go along with that. It is just simply God's instruction pointing the way as Hans Joachim Kraus, I'm assuming I'm pronouncing his German name right, says, under no circumstances should we translate this word as law. And we cannot introduce into this word a legalistic concept because it is, it is the the gracious relationship that God has provided with his people that he has already established. Um, <clears throat> and these words here, not only just making wise the simple, but reviving life or soul, uh, rejoicing the heart, those are so evocative. Um, there is a joyousness here, kind of like that, that sun going out and he's running his course with joy right. and blesses the whole world with, with the, the life giving heat and life giving yeah. light. The Torah is doing the exact same thing to all those 
who allow themselves, and I, I kind of go with the idea of making wise the simple, is that it initiates the uninitiated into a certain way of life right. that results in blessedness. That's what yeah. it does. Yeah, I think it, I think another another way of thinking about that is maybe an analogy. You know, when we're raising our kids, we might want to say, "Okay, you need to learn how how our family does things." Right. Right. This is who our family is. These are the traditions right. of our family, and right. this is our identity. So you want to grow up and be like us. You know, want to be like this family and carry on the traditions. And that's what the Torah is intending to do. It's it's telling a story, and this is our story. And we need to live up to that story. We need to be a part exactly. of that story exactly. and live out that story and uh, teach that story to our children. And that's kind of Torah. Instead of thinking it in terms of some kind of legal burden, uh, it's a it's the story of how to become the people of God and how to be formed into that identity, which I think is exactly. how Paul thinks about it. I mean, it was, yeah, we could get into a big discussion about Paul here, but... Um, fundamentally, Paul thinks the law is holy and good and righteous. He doesn't have a problem with Torah. You know, he doesn't have a problem with the instruction that comes from the books of what we call the books of Moses and, and from the whole Hebrew Bible. He's quoting it all the time and uh, bringing to bear all, all that story upon his own life and upon the lives of those he's teaching. So I think he... He thinks it's fundamentally good, not fundamentally something to reject or yeah. take as evil. Yeah, he says in Romans 3, verse 31 or 32, he says, we established the law. <laughs> we're, yeah. not, we're not tearing it down. It's one of those texts we almost always never quote. But, you know, um, Paul, you went to 2 Timothy chapter 3, and I think you're exactly right. When Paul uses that language about how Scripture makes us wise unto salvation and he gives you know, uh, uh, he equips us to all good things, you know, trains us in righteousness. That is such a Jewish way of thinking about the Torah. And I think Paul is channeling Psalm 19 and Psalm 119 uh, in doing that. Uh, I, I consciously think that Paul's doing that consciously. And it says, this is what, uh, this is what uh, Torah, its function is. Its function is to guide us as the people of God to live under that message from heaven in a way that results in our receiving God's blessing um, as he intended it to be. Right. It's fundamentally for our own good. It right? is for our own in order, good. In order to be authentically human. That's right. To be authentically human is to live Right. under this voice of God from heaven, from the voice of creation, and to embody that in the, as we see it in the, in the history, in the story of Israel, so that we can become the sort of people that we were created to be, right? and right. to flourish as human beings. Yep. So let's we, take a look, go ahead, one no, last point. I was point just going to say, that. yeah, if we put this again in the narrative context of, of the story, bring in Psalm 136, uh, that that Torah's story is constantly the story of God's Hesed, God's grace, the steadfast mm -hmm. love. Um, <clears throat> that's the fundamental point. It's not about Israel saving themselves or any Jew saving themselves. They're already saved. And everything that's going on is the proclamation of God's love, God's Hesed for them. God is caring for them. And we we open up our hearts and open up our hands. And as Moses will say in Deuteronomy, you know, hey, circumcise our hearts, you know, and uh, so that we can love you and obey you and be what you want us to be. And yeah. I think that is what is going on here, that the worship leader is calling the people to have a certain orientation, just like to creation, but a certain orientation to God's verbal, if you want to call it that, instruction through the yeah. the festivals and the story that we yeah, regarded are... as valuable regarded as sweet <clears throat> this is something right. to uh ingest and, and it has a great flavor to it you know it's sweeter yeah. than honey uh that sort of thing so which in the ancient world is the most sweet yeah. thing that they know rejoice <laughs> there was no saturn yeah, in the ancient world there was no 
corn it's their syrup. sugar, right? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, so don't think of the Torah as a burden. Think of it as something to enjoy and savor because it is God's guidance for what authentic human life can can look Absolutely. like. So that's why the, the psalmist at the end here is concerned about, am I getting it? <laughs> am you I know, getting am, it? Am, am I, am I am, not only I want to embrace this, but but I know myself too. I, I know <laughs> that I have hidden faults and I know that I have struggles. Uh, so when you get to verse 12, who can discern their own errors? You know, right. forgive me. Let go. Let go of yeah. this for me, God. You know, release yeah. me from this this sense of guilt and for, for uh, of my hidden faults. Help exactly. me to know myself. I want to know the Torah better, and I want to hear your voice in creation better, so that I can know myself better Absolutely. and become what you call us to be and yeah. be in relationship with you. And that, that ties into really well. I've spent almost a year in Psalm 119, where I think it's just this massive prayer for divine illumination. That's mm -hmm. what you find here in verse 12. Uh, you know, clear me. This this is actually a prayer. This is addressing the God. Yeah. This is where the congregation comes together, and we're we've had instruction, and now we're we're praying back to the Lord. We're asking for divine intervention, right here. This is. This is okay. This this is the covenant of Hesed relationship going on here. I need God, you to do something that I cannot do. That that's what this text says. I cannot detect my hidden faults. You can, just like the sun reveals everything around us. The Torah, which is perfect, does the same thing. Now the 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 the, the Torah is not condemning here. The Torah is illuminating and bringing life. And so the psalmist the, says, the Torah you know, can release us. Me. Yeah, it That's can it. release us, right? It can release us. And so, so if you if look God at verse 13, eliminates. you get the keep your servant also from willful sins. May they not rule over me. That is the, the Torah can keep us. If we if we follow the guidance in the Torah, then we will um, have a way or have a path, a way, a direct, right, to avoid addictions <laughs> That's right. to avoid That's right. um the the misuse of god's good creation That's right. to, to avoid the misuse right. of what is good in creation like wine and uh sex and i mean there's a lot of things that are good in creation but if we abuse them and we can become addicted to them god keep us from that give give me Absolutely. insight from your torah help yeah. me, guide me through your torah so that i don't fall into these <clears throat> willful habitual enslaving kinds of sins right and twice the psalmist leads the people to identify themselves as the servant mentions that twice right servant so mm -hmm. here the the community and the individual prayer warrior is submitting to the lordship of yahweh here okay i need i need you to do this and I'm willing to follow you where you go. <laughs> That's mm -hmm. what I'm willing to do. It it is a uh, well in in modern terms, and uh, we might call this a discipleship image. <laughs> I am I'm allowing myself to be not the master of my destiny, not the one who is in control of my life, but I am your servant, and you direct my path. And then he says, after that happens. You know, I will be blameless. I will right. be what you want me to be because I'm following your lead. Yeah, and, because the uh, law is blameless and I will be right. blameless. The, now, now right. you know, I think the word blameless kind of makes us all a little cringe a little bit, you know, because, uh, <laughs> hey, I'm not blameless. I'm not perfect. But but blameless here is about integrity, about wholeness. Exactly. I want to be a person of integrity. And how <clears throat> do I become a person of integrity? Well, the psalmist says, Listen to the voice of God in creation and listen to the voice of the Lord in the Torah. Uh, and you'll become blameless like the law right. is blameless. Well, you'll, well, you'll have a sense of integrity and be yeah. innocent of the great transgression. Yeah, the word blameless has nothing whatsoever to do with being sinless or perfect. Right. So it's so interesting that Psalm 119, again, we just mentioned that. Uh, he pronounces this blessedness on those who are blameless. <laughs> 
And then the very last verse of Psalm 119 is 176, and he says, save me, you know, deliver me uh, so I can walk in your way. And all through that, he is among the blameless. He's a, I think it's just a word that identifies that I'm trying to be faithful. And to put it in simple terms, it just means I'm on your side. I am on God's side. I, I yeah. am on team Israel. I'm on team Yahweh. Well, and, and the New Testament uses this. Paul and there's an integrity of heart that goes with that. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, the integrity of the heart. Well, That's and right. we get that in the last line of the psalm. I mean, we might want to comment a little bit more about verse 14 in terms right. of this offering is is uh, is God, he wants it to be acceptable, which is the language of sacrifice. Uh, yes. You know, sacrifices are pleasing or acceptable to God. And maybe you want to comment on the sacrifice notion here. But then let's finally when we can let's conclude with, you know, that final line, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. But talk right. about the sacrificial dimension of this. Oh, well, yeah, this this is language that comes from Leviticus, where the people come together and they are conceiving the psalm itself as an act of worship. It is a sacrifice. The people could, it's not a sacrifice with animals, per se, but it's kind of like Hebrews saying the, the sacrifice of our lips, you know. Right, Hebrews 13, offered to King. And 13, 15. here the psalmist comes along and says, we're doing the same thing. We've gathered into the sacred space of God. We have heard his word, not only from creation, but heard his word from the Torah. And now we are responding to that by submitting ourselves as servant. And we're offering this to God. And we ask that you accept our sacrifice of praise, our sacrifice of our mouth. The fruit of our lips is being given to you. It is the meditation, against tying into Psalm 1, the meditation of our heart. It is the worship. This is this is worship language being given back to God as a sacrifice, just as much as the little animal being placed on the offering. We are placing this before God and may it go up and yeah. be pleasing. Exactly. I think it's a wonderful, beautiful image. It tells us a lot about Israel's worship, that it is indeed spirit and truth. <laughs> right. And um but you think stuff. about the the first two sections that we talked about, you know, verses one through <laughs> six, and then the, the Torah section. Those are more didactic. I mean, it's kind of like you're teaching Israel and kind reminding like Israel. But yeah. then we we find out, wait a minute, this didactic, <clears throat> uh, this teaching moment was a sacrificial moment. That's right. It was a moment in, of worship. It was a moment of praise. Yeah. It was a moment of offering. So. We can think about teaching and what teaching is in the church is not just kind of, well, that's a lecture that we have to listen to or that, you know, teaching in the church is also a sacrifice of worship. Absolutely. So it is an act of worship itself. Preaching is right. an act of worship. Yeah, so. there you go. That I think that fits. Now, this yeah. last line kind of brings it together. I mean, the Lord, my rock. I mean, it's almost a creation image, right? The it rock. Is, yeah. And then Redeemer is all that Yahweh image of the one That's who right. redeemed us from uh, Egyptian enslavement. Yeah. yeah. So Rock and Redeemer brings the two parts of the psalm together, right. not in tension with one another, but yeah. as as a unified voice. Right. Yahweh <clears throat> is Rock and yeah. Redeemer. And this is a phrase that's going to occur several more times in the Psalter, but this is the first time it occurs in the Psalter right here. So they brought them together in this particular spot. In the first 18, we don't have this. Now here, God is the master of creation, and creation does his bidding, proclaiming his, his hesed and his wonders and his glory. And the story does too. Oh, yes, he is the one that we hold on to, the creator who holds our life and universe together. He's our redeemer. And that is a, that's praise language right here. Oh, mm -hmm. oh Lord, my rock. And again, that my, that makes it extremely personal here. We're not talking about just some generic right. God. And it's my redeemer. Like Jesus right. and the Lord's prayer. He says, our father. So that's the same kind of thing here. This is the personalized, um, ownership of Yahweh like Yahweh does us in covenantal language that's what this is especially mm -hmm. the my redeemer this is 
It's the covenantal language. But my rock, it's my creator, too. He's the one who's uh, brought us out, which I mm -hmm. think kind of, again, ties into Psalm 136, where you got both these things going on, well, all that's... surrounded by the Hesed of God. Well, that's where the psalm ends, and maybe that's a good place for us to end, it Bobby. Yeah, um, beautiful. Appreciate song. your thoughts. What a powerful, yeah. what a powerful message we find in this yeah. psalm. It's something mm -hmm. for us all to meditate on and to offer as our sacrifice to God. And may meditating yeah. on the way always be that sacrifice that we offer to God. Absolutely. May the yeah. grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen. Amen.